my opinion is modified square root recovery. Okay, we're going along, economy was booming, went down, coming back up, but we're going to come up less than before. So there's a, there's a question that, that I've seen more and more of, and it's understandable because of the environment that we're in, but it's why the economy will rebound. Uh, and also, or not, maybe, or not, right, or <laughs> yeah. not, it, because I think there are sentiments and signals that point to it not rebounding, but also signals pointing to it rebounding. So, what are your thoughts on that? I think we are in a time where we are going to see uh, what I've dubbed the square root recovery, and uh, or the modified square root recovery. And you know, Pat, how everybody's talking about is it going to be a U-shaped recovery with a long valley, or is it going to be a V? We went down pretty hard and we're going to come back pretty quick. Uh, and, and, you know, things are coming back. It's really nice to see that. Uh, it's sort of faster than I thought. Um, but I think ultimately what we're going to see this type of recovery is going to be square root sign is like this. Remember, it goes along, then it goes down, then it goes up, and it's up higher. Okay. Well, the modified square root is it's going along goes down with the pandemic, comes up, but it comes up lower. And that's the kind of recovery I think we're going to see. I think we are waking up uh, and we're just barely waking up to it now, but we're, you know, the world, and this is not just the U.S., the whole world is going to wake up to a smaller economy than it had before. And that's initially. Uh, however, the good news is that, number one, there's, Lots of opportunity for investors, even in that environment, okay, with the mass migration to suburbia and all of that stuff we've talked about uh, on our mutual podcast. Uh, but um, the, the other thing is that uh, there are a lot of efficiencies being created in the economy over the past couple of months that you know, we don't know how efficient that's going to make us, but I think it's pretty good. And, you know, we both were talking off air today about how much more efficient we can be not traveling. Now, that's terrible for the airline industry and the hotel industry and many other industries that are related. But for business people, you know, you can just get a lot more stuff done when you stay put, okay? And, um, and so, so that's an efficiency, the efficiency of remote work, extremely efficient. Uh, a lot of new technologies that have come up to meet the needs of remote workers. Uh, so there's a lot of efficiencies being created too. Um, will that overcome the disasters that are being created? Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Um, we'll see. But when I look I, at the, the rebound and it, it, it begs the question rebound to what, right? And if it's to rebound to what was before, I don't think, I, I don't think so. I think it's in a sense, as you alluded to going to be going to be better, but you know, right now is kind of the in-between of when something happens, right. That causes, you know, plans, assumptions to not work anymore. Yeah. And, and what humanity does in times of, in times of need, which is innovate. I mean, they figure out, uh, ways of doing things different and it's usually better. And right now, you know, the outcome of traveling is, well, I need to meet with this person. I need to get this deal done or I need to go visit somebody right. or I need to X, Y, Z. But now people are figuring out other ways to do that. And I would say in a sense, more efficient ways to do that. Oh, no and question. That's about the it. genius of humanity is yeah. they always, they always end up, uh, re they rebound. Now yeah. will the economy rebound? Not to the same degree. I don't, I don't think, but humanity will rebound. They always have. And it's times like these, especially with the extreme nature of what happened, the shutdown and, and so forth. And then we have protests and rights. I mean, there's a lot of extreme things going on. But I believe that, you know, it's the yin and the yang. The more extreme, right, the more on the other side of the spectrum it's going to grow to. And so it's, yeah. it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. Well, necessity is the mother of invention, and uh, that has certainly uh, been been showing a lot lately. 
uh, no question about it. So I miss seeing yes. you. I miss hanging out with you. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, well, guess, we're doing it now. <laughs> I guess do. Yeah. I know it's it's not the same. There's no question about it. But um, in a lot of ways, uh, it does create a lot of efficiencies. So uh, so we'll see. But can you imagine the the? I mean, look at the the size of the industries that have been hit hard from this. And I mean, the layoffs and the bankruptcies and the foreclosures that will come out of this, it's significant. There's no question about it. Uh, but there are some areas of the economy that are interestingly very insulated. I mean, low cost necessity housing in my world, very insulated. Now, what's interesting about your business though, which is so unique, you know, insurance, as I always talk about, it's it's the one of the most unique industries in the world because it has this very unique characteristic negative cost of capital and uh, and meaning that you pay for it before you get the get it right which most things you know you get it and then you pay for it or you pay for it at the same time you get it right uh, but insurance you pay for it first so insurance companies um, have an interesting thing now you're on the life insurance side but other insurance has been is going to be hugely hit I mean you know, Wow, uh, you know, with the civil unrest and all the damage and all those insurance claims, all the business interruption claims from that, but previously COVID uh, and continuing COVID. Uh, so the insurance industry is going to be pretty hard hit from that. But I don't know about life insurance. Like your your business is good through all this, right? I mean... Yeah, they, you know, you you, go, you look at history, right? That's really the only, the only barometer you have. But you look at history and they've... Uh, been able to thrive through some challenging times, you know, world world wars, uh, other, you know, epidemics, pandemics, because uh, these industries have been around for, you know, a couple hundred years. And, and for them, you know, it's one of those, it's very similar to your, your industry where everybody needs a place to live, right? right. And there's kind of a median uh, part of the bell curve right. where that sits a lot of people, right? tens, yeah. probably hundreds of millions of people. Right. They and don't it, need, they don't similar. need a, they don't need a really expensive place to live no. in a city, but they do need a place to live. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. So it's one of those things where it's like, you know, whether it's a, a building or a car or a business interruption insurance, I would say that those are micro, but from the life side of things, it's macro because every, it's every, it's everybody and it's, and it's life. Like these are circumstances that don't have a huge impact on mortality. Uh, but I have seen, where it is more difficult from a health standpoint uh, to to go through, you know, certain uh, get certain approval ratings and health ratings, uh, but at the same time, nothing else has been really impacted. In fact, these are the times where these types of companies thrive because they have a lot of capital and they know how to make good investment. And I would say the best investments they've made in the past are, you know, that investor behavior curve. Right? It's when times are the worst is when they are typically ready to pull the trigger. They have dry powder to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, do you monitor what life insurance companies are investing in? Of course. Is that something you really look at? So tell us about that. That's interesting because well, they, they used very... to, they used to always like office space, you know, office buildings and shopping centers. And of course those are hard hit. Now the multifamily apartment side and they invest in that. Um, if it's not high rise, I think that's going to do pretty well where, you know, you have some social distancing opportunities and, and not have to go in elevators, garden style. Apartments, and yeah, and, and they're institutional investors. The deals that they participate in are, are really big. So it's not a, oh, sure. you know, a one-off multifamily apartment. You know, these are big, bigger, bigger buildings. It could be developments. It could be land. And that's an example I use quite often is, you know, one of the, one of the companies we work with, uh, purchased a, a huge parcel of land on the Boston Harbor uh, during kind of like the 2000, 2001, during those, you know, dot-com crash plus 9-11. Uh, but they bought a, a huge plot of land for like $100 million and have sold individual parts of that parcel for over a billion. So it's wow. one of those, you know, these are, again, the, not and there aren't many people or companies that can write a $100 million check, right? But insurance companies, these big mutual private companies yeah. can. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that's amazing. So, have you have you seen any evidence of that they've changed their focus? That they're you know more focused on housing versus shopping centers because the shopping centers will be really hard hit. The office space will be really hard hit. The housing's good. 
Um, you know, there's other asset class, medical office, I'd say would be pretty good. That'll be the one office category that'll probably be okay through this. Um, have you, it, does it get that granular in your, your view of it? Not usually, you know, there, there's regulations as far as what they can invest in, uh, how much of their portfolio based on the rating of the, of the company, because they're all rated. There's a few different rating agencies, you know, similar to how, uh, companies, you know, just publicly traded companies are, are rated that take out debt. Uh, insurance companies are also rated. And so based on their size and based on their rating, it gives them some flexibility as far as where they can invest, but it's regulated. Uh, so in large part, they have, you know, very safe assets. You know, they uh, have big positions in uh, the debt of, you know, really strong, stable companies. Uh, but they also have, uh, they, they own mortgages. And these are mortgages usually on commercial properties and and their LTVs are at extremely low rates. I mean, you, you rarely see so the loan to value ratio is low. So the yeah, because when there's a default, there's saying. a default yeah. on like a bond, right? Yeah. That they that they own. There's a, there's a default on the real estate that they own, right? That impacts the way in which they're rated, and subsequently what they can invest in. So yeah, but they they do they do release reports as far as their portfolio is concerned, and you can okay. see that on an annual basis. Not Let, let's flip to the other side of that equation, though. What about the consumer side of it? So, have you seen these uh, life insurance companies? Uh, there are they being more strict on their underwriting criteria? Are they rejecting more applicants? Are they raising their prices for insurance? In other words, that's a barometer of whether or not they think the risk is higher. What what's going on there? Definitely. So first off, there's regulations around the you know mortality expenses. Okay, so there's a whole you know commission that does this, and they usually do it about every ten years. There was actually one done in 2017, the most recent one. Uh, so there's a regulation on that from that standpoint. However, there are different tiers of health that a person can be in, and you know there's all sorts of different criteria. Uh, and so there, I've seen them adjusting those. Yeah. So it's, if somebody is, you know, older and has some health conditions, that is something that is definitely high risk these days, given, given COVID. So we've seen, right. Lots so of they've, they've, they've increased the price and they're declining more yep. people, right. But price is higher too. Uh, price is higher because of ratings, right? So they can adjust how they rate somebody. So if you have a, you know, a standard way in which mortality is measured, right. Then you can have substandard, or above standard, okay? And above standard gives you a little bit better rating. Substandard gives you a worse rating. So the actual standard, they can't, they don't touch, that's regulated, but the, you know, above and below standard, they can. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. What else uh, can you tell us about that? I, I mean- Well, it's one, it's one of those things factors. where, you know, it's, it's a sign that they know how to respond during difficult, difficult times. And I, I would say from an you know, economy rebounding and, or not rebounding, it, it's the companies that don't have the experience of downturns that are are getting hurt or that have overextended themselves. And these are big, you know, these are big companies. Starbucks just announced that you know 500 locations are yeah. are going away, right? So it's one of those like people, big companies are reacting to it because it wasn't necessarily, you know, these events weren't priced into their their business model. And now that it's there. I would say you're going to have a different way of doing business. I'm not sure if wages are going to get hit or benefits are going to get hit. I don't know, but companies are going to act differently because now what's priced into their business model is something like COVID, some black swan event that can come out of left field and disrupt the entire world economy right. you know, for, for two and a half months. Jason, I was, I was interested yesterday. Um, I, got, I got a news flash. And there was this guy that was in a silent retreat for, mm -hmm. for uh, 90 days. And 90 days. Wow. Yeah, oh, and he, he just, missed and he everything. Just, and he just wow. got out. So I, I challenged my 15-year-old daughter. I said, okay, and I, because she was sitting next to me. I said, all right, so if I'm that person, right, talk to me about what went on over yeah. the last 90 days. <laughs> Explain <laughs> it to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, know what, you know what's amazing is we the, the time has been – I mean, the time perception for all of us, the entire world has just changed so much because uh, the news was just coming at us so quickly. And then with the civil unrest, you know, sort of at the time that the op the reopenings were starting, uh, it's really crazy. But do you realize that the biggest news story of 2020, we thought it could have been 
what was going on in January. You realize what was going on in January? The Australian wildfires. That's true. Nobody's even thinking about Nobody that. Nobody even remembers. Yeah. And right before that were the Amazon wildfires, right? It's like that's out of our collective consciousness. And it just goes to show you that people in some ways have a really short memory and, um, and, and you know, collectively, we can't pay attention to that much. We just can only pay attention to a few things. And I notice this whenever I go uh, and, you know, I'm sort of kicking back in a hotel room on a trip somewhere. Uh, and, you know, I'll just let the news play. And I do not do this at home, by the way. And, you know, many times I haven't even had a TV at home. I just can't handle the commercials and the garbage on it. But, but you know, I'll just turn on a news station on the TV in a hotel room a lot of times and just let it play. And it's like the same six stories over and over all day long. You know, you can, you can, if you're there for a conference, you go to the conference in the morning, turn on the news, you come back, turn on the news. It's like the same six mm -hmm. stories, you know, it, it, it's just a repeat. And, and I, I think to myself, isn't there anything else going on in the world? Of course there is, there's way more, but maybe they're just lazy and they don't cover the other things or it's just that people can't perceive any more than that. You know, that's entirely possible. So well, I also uh, say that these are, these are times when I think people think differently. That's why the questions that you and I have been answering uh, are so important because they're different questions that may have uh, not been asked previous to, to COVID. And so you look now at the disruption and I think there's more questioning of media uh, and people are asking themselves, it's about time. Is, is that true, <laughs> way, right? Yeah. Is that perspective right. right? Is there another perspective? Yeah. And trying to form that, because it does, you know, media definitely has the majority of people's attention. Yeah. And that's yeah. where they get influenced. And then because of, you know, our, our upbringing and most people in the, in the public school system, you know, we're taught to listen and to obey in a sense. And we have to do what we're, what we're told. Yeah. I think people are questioning it these days. And I think that's yeah. a good thing because now it's they're going to seek out thing. other yeah. forms of, of media and news and have ways in which they can validate what's true and what's not. And, and sadly, those ways are being censored by the big disgusting tech companies. Uh, we, we are on one of their platforms right now. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's really scary. Um, and, you know, love them or hate them. I got to tell you, Trump has made some really good points about the media. I mean, they are just, they have an agenda. Totally. This is not about free speech. Um, of course, free speech is important. It's incredibly important. But the media has been, the mainstream media has been telling free lies in so many ways. It's so biased. It's just ridiculous. And it's just like dividing people more and more. It's awful. So uh, we'll, we'll see what comes of it. It's, uh, well, I think there's two kind of converging forces within like a, a, an individual that, that fuels it. The first one is people hate to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. And if they're, they're wrong or they're challenged, like yep. they resist and they fight it. Of course. Uh, do, and the, yeah. and the other one is to be deceived. People don't like, people hate being deceived, lied to, told yep. mistruths. And it's kind of like you have this conversion of these two very powerful forces. Yeah. And in, in the end, you know, I think humanity in a sense uh, always, you know, prevails. It's just a, a matter of time and what else has to happen takes a long time though sometimes to work through those cycles unfortunately it does it does it does but uh, but we shall see okay so the upshot of this is uh my opinion is modified square root recovery okay we're going along economy was booming went down coming back up but we're going to come up less than before but uh the good news some efficiencies have definitely been created and we'll see how those pay off over the coming years. Your opinion, to wrap it up, I think it's somewhat similar to mine, but uh, what, do, what do you think? It is. At the, at the same time, the, the variable that I'm concerned about is because everything is fueled by credit, if credit contracts, I think that's going to negatively affect the economy. So I look at how do you measure the economy Again, economy will rebound. Will rebound is a is a function of measurement because you're rebounding to a certain you know measurable level, uh, and I I believe that you know paying attention to the Fed, what they're doing, how they're stimulating expansion, contraction of credit, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out because I think that's going to be a variable that uh, may 
you know, may make some of our assumptions uh, in, invalid, right? These are these kind of black swan variables that who knows what's going to happen. At the same time, like I said, long term, I agree with you. I think that the economy is going to be even better because it's going to be more efficient. There's going to be less waste. Yeah. Yep. Interesting stuff. All right, everybody. Happy investing. And uh, thanks for listening in today. Thank you, Jason.